wrote this sermon a month ago. And if you think back, a month ago I was home very sick with COVID. And when Nancy saw me up and at the keyboard, she asked what I was doing. I told her I was writing a sermon, but it seemed a bit different. Actually, I said it's kind of weird. I think I'm going to sing a little bit of it. And the advice Nancy gave as she patted my name was, well, before you preach it, you better tell them it was written with COVID brains. <laughs> so there you have it. You've been warned. Also, I need to point out that I wrote this before we knew we would be installing what we hope to our wonderful new music director, theater. So you can't blame him at all for when I get to what I'm calling singing. Robin did a really good job reading Psalm 137. It's one of the hardest to read, I think, because of the content of one of the most powerful psalms on so many levels. It was written in lament over the capture and destruction of Judah by Babylon, and the hauling away of many Judeans to an exile in a far, far away foreign place. And there's a somewhat famous modern song from the Broadway musical Godspell based on the first part of Psalm 137. It's sung as Jesus and the disciples have the last song just before Jesus is captured, hauled away by the Roman conquerors of his day. The song on the willow is sad, it's mellow, and it speaks to anyone who's been in a place in life where it seems there can never be joy, a place where there does not seem to be any hope left at all. The song and the music from God's will capture the melancholy of those first verses of Psalm 137. And with apologies to Stephen Schwartz and to Theo, who's not here today, and it's not because I'm singing. My abbreviated version of the song goes like this. On the willows there, we hung up our lyres, for our captors there required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion, sing us one of the songs of Zion, but how can we sing, sing the Lord's song in a foreign the 
misery inflicted on them by battle, on the death, the conquest, and the exile. And they felt abandoned, or wicked, or both. It seemed that God was punishing them all for decades of exile and battle in the capital. Capital of a people of a rival and very wrong for them, God. That sort of theology offers little or no hope in the long run, and it offers no logical form of love from God. No set of people deserves of terror and terrible happening, certainly not the God who is loves people. God's people as a whole didn't actually cause the conquest and the acts of, and the exile from the misdeeds that Yahweh punished them for with violence and Havoc. They were victims of constantly warring and conquering nations. And the little Jewish nations on the edges and the crossroads of empire were caught up in the waves set up by much more powerful nations. Waves that ebbed and flowed and often swamped like a tsunami over small countries in the region. And their people suffered greatly. You may recall that for a while the kingdom of Israel had been united in its glory days under King Saul and Solomon and David. Those days are referred to as the united monarchy, which lasted just a little while, from the middle to late 11th to the early 10th century BC. The united monarchy ended when it divided into shortly after Solomon died. The northern section kept the name Israel southern section called itself Judah. And eventually the kingdom of Assyria swallowed up Israel in 720 BC and the Jewish tribes that were said to have comprised the north were scattered all over the place and become the lost tribes of Israel. The Judah in the south of the temple of Jerusalem remained intact for a while but, but became in essence a vast estate path back and forth between Assyria and Babylon with Egypt playing one off the other. And Judah, Judah caught up in the middle, rode the waves of those constantly warring nations on a very small boat in a stormy ocean. Its leaders trying to choose the site best for survival to avoid sinking like its northern sister Israel had. In 597 BC, Judah was under the thumb of Babylon, which began warring with Egypt. Judah chose to side with Egypt and revolted against Babylon, trying to escape from under that crushing thumb. And Babylon responded by putting Judah under a siege and then attacked and conquered it and relocated many of the elite leaders and wealthy to Babylon. The Babylonians claimed Judah as their state and installed their ruler. But within a few years, Judah chose again to side with the Egyptians and revolted again, and another siege ensued. And the final siege ended in 587 when Babylon entered the city. Babylon decided that a stern lesson was in order, and so it burned and knocked the entire city of Jerusalem apart and hauled up more of the rulers and elites, leaving behind farmers and the poor to tend to the state to eat out something from the land for Babylon. And the Jewish captives from both 597 and 587 were kept in exile in Babylon until the next power ship. Much later, in 538, when Assyria conquered Babylon under Cyrus the Great and finally let all the exiled Judeans who wanted to, to return home. The Psalm 137 was written with an exile experienced dramatically in mind. Reflecting the sense of sadness and despair of those in exile experience a horrible war and losses and seemingly interminable exile. And we can hear it in a painful yearning for Zion, which is Jerusalem, the capital of their home and holy ground, the held sacred temple. There's more than lamenting Psalm 137, of course, the ending verses are so hard. There's hate for their enemies and Edom who cheer for Judah's downfall and raising Babylon inflicted. And there's hate, too, at the end of the song, the disturbingly graphic wish for violence to infants and a deep, awful hate in God's people for Babylonians. 
Psalm 137 not only roots for the destruction of Babylon, it lifts up happiness as a reward for the murder of Babylonian infants by invading soldiers, murders the terrible crime that Babylon had inflicted on Judean infants and their families. We have in this one short psalm so much about war and its terrible emotional toil and damage and its engendering desire and justification for retaliatory violence. The kernels of the cycle of continuation of war exist in Psalm 137. War itself is pithily wrapped up in the words. We empathetically sense hurt in and beyond the words. We can feel 2,500 years later the deep despair and anger against the people who had war brought upon them, wanting war brought to others. I, it was done to us, and we want it done to you, and those who support it. <coughs> there may be no psalm with better supporting evidence for the biblical decree and Torah law of an eye for an eye and two upon an enemy and that innocent children. Psalm 137 is raw and it's chilling and it's painful and it's unloving and it's not peaceful by any means at all. Exodus 21 actually sets out the Torah law I mentioned like this. If any harm follows then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike. In Latin, the legal term for this is lex talionis. It means the law of retaliation. It's retributive justice. That is, it's about punishment. It sees the justice that is due is punished. And there seems to be something in humankind's primitive nature that wants to lash out and do to others what has been done to us or to our kin. It's not the golden rule where we do to others what we want done to ourselves. It's the opposite rule that I think of as the Latin rule, where we shoot those who shoot us or kill their kin as they kill ours, and we call it just. And the whole of Psalm 137 lets us understand the feelings that lead to the Latin rule. We were hurt, and we hurt, so we want to hurt others. Get back, get even, judge others, and punish them exactly as they did to us. Tit for tat. Sadly, before the Babylonian exile, God was not to judge and punish like men. Men made God in their image. He was a he and was believed to smite those he felt did wrong. He smited them, or smote them, with punishing misery, war, diseases, floods, fires, and other bad things. And many still think God is like that. We hear all the time about natural disasters being wrought by God for conduct this or that person or the church doesn't like. And in the time leading up to the exile, some prophets, as I said, said similar things. Bad things to the leaders or people did would cause God to be punishment. So get right or look out for God's vengeance. And we do hear that today, right? Some sort of do what we claim the Bible says God wants and will get violently and ruthlessly punished by God now or later in hell. Violent and ruthless punishment is not loving. It never has and never will come from God. God is love. As horrible as the exile was, it did have a positive side effect. It caused God to be reimagined, reimagined in Judaism. God is reimagined as love, as love. Well, like I started to say earlier, the theology of God causing the conquest and exile is punishment offers little or no hope in life. The reality is life has lots of misery. And so even if we are good, we cannot win because bad things happen to good people. And the book of Job that also came out of the exile experience is about that. Job is righteous, but he's in misery. He 
people tell Job it's divine punishment, but it can't be. We know it can't be in the story because Job is good. And sure enough, we learn in that book that the bad Job encounter isn't divine punishment, just like the bad the psalmist encounter, just like the bad we encounter. And this is addressed in the Bible in more than just the story of Job, the post exilic writers known by scholars as the priestly writers address this reality, and they do so brilliantly. They redact and they add to Torah a new understanding of God. They, they even create a new creation story to show order coming from chaos, hope out of the unknown. And the new creation story is now found at the start of the Bible, at the start of Genesis, and it demonstrates God's power over chaos with word alone. God as cosmic sovereign creates order out of chaos. And God orders the days and the week in that story of creation, and he declares all of creation good. We are good, not bad. And the sixth day in that story is the most important beasts are created, and then humans, both men and women, are made in God's image to be God's emissaries, caretakers, and stewards of the earth. Humans are given God's blessing. They are divinely empowered. They are good and godly made. In the Old Testament, Professor John Brocky taught us that the priest creation is going to provide a powerful affirmation about God's power to work chaos, about the decisive role of humankind in God's creation, and therefore exiles an alternative view of what it means to be human. And this new understanding is infused in other Bible stories, including even the flood story, where God makes a covenant with creation after the devastation of the flood, and the flood becomes a metaphor for the devastation of the exile. In the post-exilic version of the flood story, God makes a unilateral and unconditioned covenant. It's a divine no strings attached promise. Obedience by humans not required benefit from God's love. The promise alone sustains God's relationship with humans, regardless of location, inside or outside of the Holy Land, regardless of human conduct, there will be no more God-made catastrophes like the flood or the exile. Humans and laws of nature may cause bad things to happen, but not Yahweh. And this is transformative stuff for the exiled and scattered people of God. It puts God where they are. It names them and all of creation as good. It declares all humans to be images of God. It makes all human God's agent on earth. And out of this new understanding, there's a sense that our neighbors and even our enemies and their babies are worthy of God's love and by extension worthy of our love as equal images of God and as God's agents. The 600 years or so after the exodus, Jewish rabbi in the Holy Land created a movement that centered on that sense and understanding and anchored in love. He modeled rejecting unloving scripture like an eye for an eye. He taught his followers to love everyone, even their enemies, and to do to others what they want done to themselves. The desire for the well-being of others was to be the focus of their life and their faith. And no other commandment in all the scripture was more important than to love. And so love was to rule all they did, just as it ruled his life and his way. My rabbi's name, of course, is Jesus. And today many of us follow his way of love, the way that he teaches me to live. So God can use us anywhere, anytime, even in exile, even in lament, and even for our enemies' well-being. Living Jesus' way doesn't lead to a life without troubles or to a life without exile and lament, but it does lead to the lessons of the exile, that God is good and we are to all of us, and that as agents of God we are to strive for the well-being of the entire world. And that is good news. And we are to rejoice in it 